So uh, yesterday we talked about uh, narratives, prose narratives. That's where we started from. And I would like us to continue from there. Uh, we said we basically have myths, mythology, stories that are related to the gods. Uh, every time we encounter them, we find that they have to do with the origin. They are not very easy to scientifically prove, but then they are related uh, to the gods. And apart from that, we have stories that are not related to the gods, stories about uh, human beings like you and me. And uh, these we called folk tales. And we said amongst these, we have uh, tales about animals or tales about human beings. And I think the time we are parting, we are looking at uh, uh, the legend. No, 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 we, we finished discussing the legend. Uh, we went to, yes, we discussed, uh, I remember very well now, we discussed uh, the, uh, the parable. We also, yeah, we discussed the parable, we discussed the fable, we discussed the legend. Yeah, we, we, we discussed those. And then we, amongst other folk tales, I think we looked at Kamdoti and the impression, you know, the story that it gives us, uh, what we learned from it. Yeah, we we're looking at Kamdoti. I think that was the last uh, story that we discussed uh, yesterday uh, evening. Uh, now, I would like to say one more thing. I think that uh, that's interesting about our stories. Uh, I remember very well listening to these stories growing up myself uh, from my mother and my grandmother. Uh, they told me a lot of these stories and actually that's one of the reasons I'm in love with, with literature today, particularly oral literature. I'm very much in love with it. I'm in love with uh, uh, intangible cultural heritage, which you know, uh, oral literature is a part of. So it's because of my background and I said that I expect you to equally love this uh, because it's basically you know, part of your cultural heritage. It is something you've grown up with. It is something that, you know, you have interacted with for so long. So I would like us to take advantage of the fact that we have these backgrounds, we have these histories with these, you know, with these literatures uh, that we should uh, use. Uh, then I asked Martha, who was unable to tell me the story of Kamunu and Nyambe. Uh, but then I'll ask, I'm trying to see the names that are here. Faith Hantuva. Faith Hantuva, can you hear me? Faith Hantuva. Can you unmute your microphone, Faith? Or maybe you have just uh, logged in and then disappeared, knowing that we're recording the lecture. I know a lot of people do that. Okay, Faith is not here. It's only the computer that is present. Uh, who can talk about the story of Nyami Nyami and the wife? Who can tell us about that one? I expected Faith to be able to handle that for obvious reasons. Okay, we have Grace and Joe. All right, so Grace, you go first. Tell us about Nyami Nyami and the wife. Um, I don't know so much about Nyami Nyami. All I've uh, heard is that uh, it's a god. That's all. <laughs> uh, from which cultural grouping, if I may ask? Uh, from Tongas. I think it's from Tonga, part of the, the Tonga culture that is also in Zimbabwe. I don't know, but something like that. Okay, that's correct. Uh, let's listen to Joel. Joel Mulenga. Hello, can you get me now? Yes, Joel can hear you now. Go ahead. Sure. What I know about uh, Yami Nyami is I, uh, in the Zambezi, and uh, a, a few a few Zambians have uh, seen the uh, have 
testify to have seen uh, the God. And the story is that uh, when they started building Kariba Dam, uh, the wife was off. It was not with the the wife was not with the, hu- uh, the husband. So the dam actually separated the two, and that is uh, why uh, the the construction people faced some challenges. They said. Uh, destroyed the dam and uh, uh, there were deaths at the dam but eventually they uh, he, he approved and uh, they managed to build do you think it's true that uh, those deaths that took the, you know that happened at the dam were caused by yami yami well I haven't proved yet, and uh, I don't know. There's no, there's no scientific proof for that. But uh, well, it's part of our cultural heritage. Okay, great. Now uh, it's very difficult for us to prove any of these things, and that's why you know every time I ask you to proving them. Uh, it's not that I want you to prove, but I just want you to be aware that it's very difficult to prove and yet these are part of our cultural heritage. I ask you this time and again because I know how, how much you believe you know, uh, the cultural heritage of the Hebrews and how far you are ready to discredit your own as an African. And with me, that is what I have problems with. I would like us to be aware that every cultural grouping has its own cultural heritage. And it is this cultural heritage that defines the people. We are not defined by the cultural heritage of other people. However, nothing stops you from you know, adopting any elements from any cultural grouping that are going to help you. And that's why we're discussing all these elements. So we have a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, uh, let me say mystical stories, you know, they, they're mystical. So they're not only mystical, there are those stories that are mythical, well, there are also those stories that are mystical, okay? It's mystic, you can't explain it, it's quite, it's full of questions. I, I would like us to be aware of all those stories. And uh, right now, I want to tell you that your first assignment actually will be a collection of mystical stories, okay? Mystical stories, these uh, stories of the Makaba, stories such as, uh, uh, re- remember, uh, okay, re- remember the story by, what's the name of this guy, Pike Chishala of the Ilomba. I know most of you have heard that story, okay? It's called Church Elder. That's the song. The song is Church Elder. I remember that story. That's a mystical story. But this time, I'd like you to get into your you know, into your cultural space and explore these stories, okay? What stories are there? So it's mystical stories, stories that are, are quite questionable and they seem, they seem so true. Uh, now, this time I would like us to get into two areas that have not really been talked about a lot. And almost all the time we talk about oral literature, we're focusing so much, uh, particularly on oral prose narratives, we focus chiefly on, you know, uh, these prose narratives that have been you know, uh, passed from generation to generation, I mean, these are traditional stories there, you know, the part of our cultural heritage. But I think uh, there are those stories that we have, you know, that we have in urban settings, which we call urban legends, okay? Uh, urban legends haven't been talked about a lot. I think uh, most people have taken them for granted that maybe they do not have any value. And yet these urban legends are stories that we focus on, we pay attention to, we listen to. They are stories that can, you know, equally, as I said, they have some truths. Okay, there is some truth in it, but you find that with time it's been embellished. It's got, you know, elements that we cannot really accept, elements that are questionable. And one of the most famous of these stories is the story of Maria Chivanda. I don't know if uh, you people remember the story of Maria Chivanda. 
Maria Chivanda is this girl who, is, who was a prostitute and then she's killed. And then later she starts making these people who killed her and including actually the rest of her clients to pay back. Some end up at her burial site. There is also, you know, all those stories. Uh, is there anyone here who remembers that story? Please raise your hand if you remember the story of Maria Chivanda before I bring you to, a, to an even more recent story. The story of Maria Chivanda. Could it be the story of Maria Chivanda, England? It's not possible. Maria Chivanda. Okay, that's quite interesting. Uh, then those that went to boarding school, uh, you will remember the story of uh, some people said Chi people, others said Ka people. This girl who wears a schooner on one foot and uh, a, you know, a reporter on the other foot, which also made rounds quite scary. People were quite uncomfortable with it, always scared. And whenever it entered the hostel, there would be a lot of noise. Uh, who remembers hearing such a story? Stories of people. Yes, Grace, you were the first one to raise your hand, then Annie. So Grace will be followed by Annie. Yes, Grace. Yes, so I was in boarding school at some point, and I remember that story. So we never used to go in the abrusion blocks in the night because we would be, we'll hear that there's someone who wears a kaskuna and they will be traumatizing us. Mm -hmm. And I also hear that same story from my, my daughter. Sometimes she's in boarding school. She oh. also talks about that, that lady who... Okay, I think uh, Grace's uh, microphone has misbehaved, but yes, that's a very true, Grace. Uh, that, that, that's a very common story. I think almost everyone who has been to boarding has said that story. Annie, you also wanted to say something. Please go ahead. Annie Chikonde. Yes, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's similar to what Grace was saying. Uh, there were stories where you, you would hear um, stories of the schooner in the hostel. So there are times when you're having prep in the night, mm -hmm. when you need something from the hostel, you wouldn't go there until everyone is there because of the same stories. You're scared. So you even end up imagining the sound when you're alone. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's very correct. So all these are our stories, okay? I know the urban legend isn't talked about so much, particularly in literature uh, classes, because it is not taken to be, uh, to be high literature. It is taken to be popular literature, but whether it's popular literature or not, it is part of our literature. And you should be talking about it because these are our stories, okay? So if you just did some research, you come across many such stories. They are everywhere, everyone has them. Then the most recent one I wanted to refer you to is the story of uh, this man. I think it happened about 10 years ago. This man who was driving a black, I don't know if it was a hammer, but I think the vision of the car was also changing every now and again, who would go for very beautiful girls, uh, sleeps with them, gives them a lot of money. Then the girl ends up with uh, maggots on her private parts. So she starts rotting on the private parts. and. Uh, it, a lot of people insisted that actually it was true because uh, some people had seen, you know, a girl in UTH, that's University Teaching Hospital, you know, with maggots on her, you know, on her genitalia and uh, doctors are trying to deal with it, but they are failing because it's a spiritual issue. Uh, does anyone remember this story of the guy driving a, a BMW or is it a Hammer, but it is black? and he's very rich, he must have been colored in somehow. I can't remember that very well. Does anyone remember this story? Yes, I do, sir. They even produced a song called Vikusi Vikusi. Oh, I don't remember the song personally. Okay, that, that, that's very interesting. There was a song. Vikusi Vikusi, sir. I don't know if it's Devin Rokanen who produced that song or not. Uh -huh. Okay, that's true. Yeah, so- that's uh, different versions, a lot of- uh... Yeah. Musicians produce the song for the same. For the same issue. Yeah, I think there are about four versions for the same. 
yeah, that, that, that's quite interesting. But now, now you see the effect that these urban legends, and when you talk about urban legends, I'd like you to know that we're talking about literature. Okay, this is literature. This is what we are interested in. So you see that the, the, the impact it has, it even gets into art. Artists get material for their work based on these same legends. So we have a lot of such stories. All these are part of our oral literature. These are narratives. And then the last element I would like us to discuss under the, uh, the prose narrative is that of the joke. Equally, the joke hasn't been given a lot of attention, okay? Uh, very few people have paid attention to the joke, but you will agree with me that the joke is a very strong element in our cultures. Almost all the time, there will be a joke, we'll come across jokes. Okay, Ruth Chanshi, please mute your microphone before we get feedback. So we're saying, Ruth Chanshi, kindly mute your microphone. Just mute that microphone. Okay, as we're waiting for Ruth to mute the microphone, let's uh, talk about the joke. So I was saying that the joke is a very interesting aspect of oral literature. Uh, you will agree with me that we all love a joke, okay? Uh, even as we are chatting with friends, we'll throw in a joke. Sometimes some jokes can be too crude where uh, people get not to be happy, people don't love them uh, because they're very strong, but well, they still are jokes, all right? So remember what I mentioned about the urban legend, it's rarely discussed in literature classes. And I think even in the paper that I've sent you, the urban legend is not appearing, neither is the joke that we're discussing right now. But still, I think it's important for us to become aware of these elements, okay? So the joke is part of our literature. Uh, there are certain jokes that have been, you know, passed on from time to time, okay? Um, a lot of people uh, are, sh are creating jokes. We have comedians, they're, okay, they're creating jokes, but they're jokes that are always retained and they'll just change form, they'll, they'll just change shape, okay? Someone will just uh, do it differently, all right? They'll do it differently. They'll create something that is, uh, that, 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 that is their own, their own production, their own creation. So there is that which happens. But then what I need just to know is that these jokes are key to our being because almost everybody needs some laughter. You need to smile, you need to laugh, you need to enjoy being you at times, you know? If you can't laugh then, well, what are you getting out of life, okay? We need to be happy. And I must have mentioned yesterday that what we're interested in above all else is happiness, enjoyment, some joy. We want to feel good. That's what we're interested in. If we can't get that, then there'll be a problem in our lives. So because we want to enjoy, we have to produce something that is sweet, something that feels good. And we say that that's the whole reason why there is literature, okay? To make us enjoy, to make us happy, to make us feel good. All right. Uh, in fact, I, I should be inviting you to a discussion that we're going to have with writers next week, where we'll be, you know, looking at the relationship uh, between uh, art and uh, meaning in literature. Okay. So, how do these two relate to each other? Uh, which one is more important than the other? How do we interact with the two? And uh, my argument basically has been that we need to be more artistic than we are uh, message oriented, okay? All right, so that, that, that's what we need. Why do I say this? It's because we need some happiness. And once we get some happiness, once we enjoy something, it gets to mean a lot to us. It gets to be everything. So that's why I feel we need art more than anything else. And that's why there is the joke. And I would be disappointed if I asked anyone to share a joke with us here, then they would have nothing to share. That would be very strange because almost everyone has had a joke and we hear jokes every day. And my thinking is that some of you are actually teachers and being teachers, you share jokes in your lectures. Every time you're going to teach, you will share, you crack a joke just to ensure that uh, your, your, your learners, you know, relax a bit. They have something to laugh about. They have something to talk about with you. Uh, there are people like me, actually, who, if I'm going to crack a joke, I will ensure that it's uh, a joke that people 
uh, will be a bit uncomfortable with, they will be embarrassed because they, they want to hear it, but then they don't want to say it because it doesn't work to them. For instance, you know, sexual jokes. A lot of people don't want to, to share sexual jokes because it's a bit embarrassing. And yet those are the jokes that they want to hear. Though, of course, you have to know the kind of audience you're going to share it with. I'll share it with you because I know you're you know, you adults, you're university students, so it won't matter much. So we have jokes, a lot of jokes, and they, they, they are good. We always laugh. And sometimes as you are thinking, you know, you're telling a joke, if you're not a, you know, uh, a comedian, if you're like me, you tell a joke, you start laughing yourself even before you, you, know, you, you tell the same joke, okay? So you're the one who is laughing. And by the time you, you, know, you, you, you finish telling the joke, everyone is laughing, it's good, okay? It feels good, it's great, okay? That, that, that's what we're supposed to do. So I think uh, these are some of the things that uh, we, we have to face, we have to do, and it's just good for us. Great, uh, this time I would like us to uh, change the direction and go into something different which is uh, the poem. But I think before we go to the poem, I'd like to get some comments from your people on what we've discussed so far. Just raise your hand, please, before you unmute your microphone. Then we'll allow you to speak. Martha, you want to say something? You've already unmuted your microphone. No, sir. Okay. Any comments from anyone before we move to the next point of discussion, which is the poem? All right, so I'll make a comment. Oh, yes, yes, it's Enoch. Yes, um, having followed the discussion on oral literature. I've come to realize one point that uh, oral literature looks to have uh, the integral part of literature. Because in my thinking, it is like uh, written literature. Many of us may not concentrate on it. Even though it might be written, but it is uh, talked about to people. So sometimes it is difficult for somebody even to believe that uh, there is this written literature because it is more or less like hidden. Uh, mostly we listen to songs and interpret them orally as we speak to others. So I feel that uh, although this written literature is there, but the integral part of literature uh, may, may sound to be oral. I don't know what is your comment. Okay, thank you very much. I love the fact that you have made that observation. Uh, maybe before I answer that, uh, do you think we are interacting with literature every now and again? You know. Of course, yes, it is on a daily basis. Great. That, that is what I wanted you to see. Every day we're interacting with literature. We do not know that it's literature. Remember what I said yesterday, literature is about us, oral literature particularly is even closer to us. So as you have put it, Enoch, oral literature is what we are interacting with every day, all the time. We have oral literature with us. We are always interacting with this. It defines us. It defines us. It tells us who we are. We might not even know it, but it always shapes our thinking. The jokes we come up with, those are part of our literature. Uh, the narratives that I've just thought about, the urban legends, you know, the mythologies, the folk tales, you know, all these are part of us. But remember, we haven't even finished discussing oral literature. We are getting into the proverb now. We are getting into the poem. We are getting into the riddle. There are all these elements of oral literature that you know that, that, that we have. Oral literature is what should be discussed before you talk about written literature. You have to remember that there is oral literature. Written literature is actually, actually rides on the back of oral literature. Now, uh, the advice I've given a lot of young artists is if you are going to do anything, if you're going to, you know, to do any work in, you know, as an artist, please ensure that that work is guided by your oral traditions, your oral arts. Are you getting me? You have, it has to be guided by the, your oral arts. It has to, you know, to start with where you come from who you are, because every time someone 
sees something that they have experienced before, it speaks to them. And if it speaks to them, they will respond to it. So you have to ensure that you know what speaks to the people. And what is that speaks to the people? It is their work. You get the point? It is their culture. It is their cultural heritage. It is their literature. That's basically the way it works. It is their literature. So oral literature is the backbone of all literature. It speaks to all literature and it speaks to us. So I agree with you on that one. That is what that is very true about oral literature. Right, so I think we can uh, we can proceed now to look at the poem. Uh, and when we talk about the poem, basically we are talking about oral poetry, of course, because we are discussing oral literature right now. Okay, so oral poetry. Uh, remember what we talked about was oral prose narratives. But this time we're getting into uh, oral poetry. Now, what's the difference between oral poetry and oral prose narratives? Uh, oral prose narratives are basically, you know, have at the root or at the bottom of them, narration It's like telling a story, kushimika, you get the point? That's the way they are. It's a tale, it's a story. You tell a story. That's what oral prose narratives are all about. All the stories that were identified, you know, the myths, the creation of the world. It's a story. How was the world created? How Kamunu, you know, uh, had, you know, a, a difference with man? How Kamunu decided to leave the earth and go to heaven? And how he sent the spider back to the earth and blinded the spider, got rid of the spider web just to ensure that there isn't a relationship. You, felt, you follow that closely. You find that it is a story. It's basically a story, all right? Uh, the urban legend, the guy who is driving a hammer, Vikusi, and all that, all that, all those are stories. So it's stories we are talking about. You see, now, if you listen to these stories, you find that they've been created, they've been crafted for our enjoyment, for our benefit, for us to deal with them, for us to interact with them. And we enjoy listening to these stories. We love this story, but at the times when we're not told that actually it's meant for enjoyment, uh, but then the question will be, what is it meant for? For instance, the urban legend, what is it meant for? It has an effect on me, okay? So it still plays a special role in my life as, you know, as, a, as the audience of this work. That, that, that is how it works. Uh, now, how about poetry? Poetry is different in the sense that while prose, which we're from discussing, is narration. Poetry is basically verse. It is versified. It is presented in verse form. And actually, uh, this afternoon, when we meet, we'll be talking about written poetry, as we're discussing oral poetry now. And we see that there are many, you know, relationships, between, you know, uh, or elements that cut across uh, both written and oral poetry. So uh, oral poetry is versified. Now I have to mention, and I know uh, most of you have read poems before and you have written poems before. And as we talk about oral poetry, you're expecting this oral poetry to take the form of, you know, of uh, the poem that you have encountered, which is written. It does not really follow that path. Oral poetry takes its own form and written poetry takes after oral poetry, just what we're from told about the, uh, the issue that uh, was identified by Enoch. Okay, so oral poetry, I mean, the written poetry takes after oral poetry. In many cases, oral poetry appears in form of, in, in the form of the song. So we encounter the poem in the form of the song. So meaning as we discuss poetry now, I would like you to know that in many cases, it is a song. So it will appear as a song. It will be like the song. That is what we have to remember. So we are talking about the song, okay? That is what is key about oral poetry. How does it take this form of the song? Oral poems in short are songs. And in many cases, what we pay attention to 
if you listen to songs, particularly in the language that you understand, it's not really the melody, but you want to hear what the song says. Now the words, remember what I said uh, yesterday about what literature is. I said it's a language art, remember that? I said in literature, when we talk about literature, we talk about the language arts, the verbal arts, okay? These arts that are created from language. And that's the reason why now, as we talk about the song, we are saying this song, we pay attention, we listen to what it says. Now, when you listen to what the song says, it means you're paying attention to lyrics, the lyrics, the words, that is the poem. So the words of the song is the poem. That is what speaks. Though we cannot run away from the fact that whatever is spoken in the poem is also treated as, you know, even what is not spoken, the sounds, the silences, all those are still part of the poem. I think we're remaining with less than uh, a minute. Uh, I think we should be cutting any time from now, meaning uh, when we are cut, we'll have to continue using the same link so that uh, we don't remain behind. Uh, and then we will continue with the discussion on the other side. Uh, okay, so I think for now we'll leave it there until it cuts, then we come back in and continue our discussion on poem. We're just trying to define the poem right now. So uh, we'll continue the definition of the poem on the other side as the system cuts us off and we continue uh, with our discussion. So I'll say thank you for now. Let's continue on the other side.